kids here? I know every year, well, golly, that was just not cool, was it? Man, every year it seems like it gets here faster and faster, but man, every year it's a good season, right? It's good to be here. Kids, if you are K, kindergarten through fifth grade, Miss Valerie and Mr. Darren over here have some stuff for you, so y'all come on down, come get something from them as they're coming to get everything. Man, we've got, this is, this is that time of the year for me that's such an interesting time because I get to share a story that we get to share every single year. It's kind of like Easter also. I know that everybody sitting in the room uh, has heard this story probably at least once in their life. And so the challenge that I and all of my pastor friends uh, get during this season is to tell the same story, the same miraculous, amazing story in ways that are creative. And in ways that it's not the same that you've heard every single year that you show up to church. And so, man, it's just, it's a, it's a challenge and it's also fun and it's exciting and it's a little bit uh, nerve wracking at the same time too, because um, the truth is also there are some years for me that I just want to stand up here and I just want to read the story. I just want the, I just want the word of God to speak for itself because we know we don't need to add anything. We know that we, we are going to tell the story in a way in which makes the, the, the story of Jesus Christ coming to this earth any more miraculous than if we just read it. But here we are, and it's Christmas, and we're going to have a great time together. It's that season of year that we get the challenge upon us, that we get to figure out how to be present in the midst of all of the hustle and bustle of the season. We get to figure out how we get to uh, find this to, to find ourselves to where we're not just going from one thing to the next. Because we got this party this Friday, we got this party on Monday, we got this performance at this time, we got this church service here, we got these things, and over and over, and I got this family here, I got my husband's family here, I got my blah blah here, and I got this here. And it's just, it's, the season is nuts. But yet the challenge we get is to be present. We get to be present everywhere, not thinking about what has to be next, but to be fully in the moment right now. In at that time. You know, it's amazing that in a season like this, this need that we all have for order tends to really bubble to the top. We all have this thing, and some of us, us OCD types, we have a need for order that's at a whole new level. Some of you that are in this room, you're like, no, 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 I'm not there. But the reality is, every one of us, we have an insatiable desire for order. We need to know how today's life event fits in to tomorrow's life event. How tomorrow's life event is going to fit into a life event that took place 15 years ago and 20 years ago. And how things that happened 20 years ago, here at, I'm dealing with this today, and how there has got to be some purpose for this. There's got to be some reason for this. And so we're looking for why. We're looking for how all of this fits and what are we supposed to do with it. It's amazing. We need to know where life's events fit into the grand scheme and how they relate to one another because then we can feel good. Then it's like the stress level begins to subside. You know, this isn't just a Christian thing. This isn't just a thing that people that, that follow Jesus, this isn't everyone thing. Every single one of us have this. We all want to be able to say, wow, everything makes sense. Everything in my life. Can you imagine being able to say that? You look at your spouse, you go, today, everything makes sense. No, oh, we all want to be able to say that, but man, we all are desiring. I mean, we want to be able to look and say, you know what? We met because we were supposed to meet. We got engaged. I got that promotion at work. Then we started having babies, and it all fits. Wouldn't that be so nice? If that's how life just played out. I mean, we find ourselves, we even use terminology to speak to this, don't we? Because we want everything to have purpose. We hope that there's a reason for everything that happens. And if it doesn't make sense now, someday we're going to look back and it's going to make sense. I mean, we use words like everything happens for a reason. Maybe you've used those words or maybe you know somebody who has. Everything happens for a reason. Yes, and sometimes that reason is you're an idiot. <laughs> right? Isn't that it? I mean, everything happens for a reason. Yeah, you made a really dumb call here. And that's why that happened. Or, whatever, or somebody else did, whatever the case may be. Everything happens for a reason. We just want it to fit together. We also, we also use phrases like, I don't believe in coincidence. There are no coincidences here on this earth. 
But I'll believe in those. You just haven't met the right person yet. There's the one. You just haven't met the right person yet. Everybody else is a jerk. You just haven't met the right person yet. You've got to meet the right person. And that means that someday, someday, but is that really the truth? Kind of interesting, isn't it? Here's another one. You, it just wasn't meant to be. There's a phrase that we use to kind of figure out thing, things. Were, they just weren't, it just wasn't meant to be, meaning it's not your fault that the relationship failed. It's not your fault that whatever the case may be happened. It just wasn't meant to be. And then here's the last one. There's a lot of other phrases, but here's another one. It'll all work out. It'll all work out. You just wait another month or two, it'll all work out. You'll be able to look back and go, yeah, it all, it all works out. Somebody may look at you and say, well, based on what? And you're kind of like, well, I don't know. But I just know it'll all work out. I just know this. There's this, this thing that we all have that we just want life. We want the items of life, the, the realities of life. We just want it to fit together. Now, this works in the somewhat negative, mostly positive thought process. This works in that. This, this, this idea that it, we want it all to fit together, it works pretty well there. But when it comes to tragedies, man, these phrases like everything happens for a reason. When it comes to tragedies, oh my gosh, all of this, it all breaks down, doesn't it? It all begins to break down. And we find ourselves asking questions like why? Why did this happen? Why? Why did it happen? It wasn't supposed to go this way. I didn't plan for it to go this way. Why did it happen? And we want to know where to file them, don't we? We want to know where to put those life events like divorce. Where did this happen? Why did it happen? It wasn't part of the plan. We want, I, don't, I don't want it to be part of life. I don't want it to be a part of my life. And so what do I do with it now? The case is also true for job loss. You're looking at it thinking, well, okay, God, this wasn't in my plan and it doesn't make sense. Certainly, there's got to be some purpose somewhere in this. Certainly. Sickness is another one. And when sickness begins to creep in and it begins to, to take over aspects of your family life and things like that, yeah, we want there to be some purpose. We want to be able to look at life's events and for there to be some purpose in some way. Because the reality is, is that we would never look at somebody that we love, most of the time we'd never look at somebody that we like, and say, and they have something happen to them, and we just look at them and go, well, life happens. I mean, I realize that your loved one was just killed in a tragic accident. We would never look at them and say, life happens. No, we want there to be some greater purpose. We want there to be some greater thing. We want these seemingly random things in our lives, the things that just show up that we have no control over. We want these things to have some purpose and to fit somewhere in the grand plan. That's for us. Now, I will tell you that at my house, my son Sam has a hermit crab. Anybody else have a hermit crab? Anybody else have a hermit crab that lived more than about a month or two, right? Yeah, right? Not they don't usually last too long, but, but, but the reality is Sam has done a great job. Rascal is alive and well. He got Rascal this summer. The thing's still alive. There is a God, I promise you, because of that. Okay, so he's got this, this rascal. But here's the thing. I'm pretty sure that Rascal, he's not asking these questions about his life. I'm pretty sure Rascal is not sitting there and he's not thinking, man, I wonder why. I wonder why there's a basketball-shaped shell in my, my little habitat. And how does that basketball-shaped shell fit in with the seashell that I'm currently wearing? I'm pretty sure he's not looking at that thing. You know, yesterday, that basketball shell was not there, but now the basketball shell is here. And I just kind of wonder if I were to... What happens with the basketball show? Then I promise you that there's never going to come a point in his life he's going to look and he's going to have the basketball show and he's going to go, you know what? I never knew this about myself, but that basketball show showed up and then I tried out the basketball show and then I found out that because of the way that I was raised, I was meant to wear a basketball show. I can assure you that our hermit crab is never going to say anything like that. But we, the human race, we find ourselves sitting here going, man, why? How does all of everything map out on this earth. Now here's the cool thing. Christians have an answer for the pursuit of order in this life. 
People who follow Jesus, they have an answer. They believe that God is a God of purpose and a God of plan. Christians believe that there is an order to creation. There is an order to our universe and that God is the author of that order. And this pursuit of connecting the dots, this connecting the dots of why things happen the way they do and how they all connect together, it is a, it is a desperate pursuit of finding purpose and order. And Christians believe that this is a direct connection to the God who created humanity in his likeness and in his image. So the reason that we long for order is because the creator God is a God of order. I mean, you can't get away. You can't get away from this creation, no matter how hard you try. You can't get away from how we are made in the image and likeness of God, no matter how hard you try. Because it's in you, and it's in me. This gut feeling that there must be some bigger purpose. There must be some bigger reason. And someday, I'm going to know what that reason is. I'm going to know how to put things where they need to go, why things are happening in my life right now the way they are, this whole pursuit, it comes from the image of God. It comes from the image of the Creator God. And the cool thing is, is that all this collides with the Christmas story. This story of seemingly random events of angels and shepherds and a virgin and this man who decided to stay with his wife even though she told him, God got me pregnant. All right? I mean, this these, these crazy, random stories. But the reality is there's a bigger purpose. And we get to explore that tonight and over the next several, several weeks. This is the V story of God entering into the seemingly random world. Where things may not seem like they go together. This chaos. The unknown of how life fits together, God enters and reminds the world that there is a plan. There is a plan of action. And God did it in such a way that was really pretty cool. God did it in such a way that it is glaringly obvious that God understands what people are going through. He understands what people are going through and there's a God who cares about. This is a beautiful, beautiful reality. And so today we're going to read a portion of the Christmas story. So go with me to Luke chapter 1. Go with me to Luke chapter 1 on your phones or on your iPods, on your physical Bible, whatever the case may be. You can access this over, over here on my left. Uh, and so you can go ahead and access it whichever way you best access Scripture. But we want to see how the story of Christmas connects to the need that we have for order in our life today. So Luke chapter 1, we're going to start 1 through 4. Now, the author of, uh, of, of this book is Luke himself. And now Luke was a physician, so Luke was a smart dude. He had lots of thought processes and lots. He was very, very educated. But it's, it's just good to know who our author is. Luke is this physician, and he wanted to make sure he got the details right. He's kind of like a surgeon. wants to make sure that it's a perfect surgery. And so the reality is, is that here's, here's Luke, this physician, wanting to get the details right. Verse 1. Many have undertaken to draw up an account. So not just one or two. There were a lot of people that tried to write down this story. This is important for us to understand. A lot of people tried to write this down. Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. So keep this in mind. That means that Luke was nearby. Luke was talking to people who were eyewitnesses of what we're going to talk about, what we're going to read here in just a little bit. Verse 3, with this in mind, since I myself have carefully investigated, not just, not just flippantly, not just trying to pass down a story that my great-grandmother told or anything like that. No, carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I too decided to write an orderly, there it is, orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things that you have been taught. Now, I just read this just really to point out, this is not some fairy tale. This is not Luke's opinion. This is not an op-ed about what happened in the first century. That's not what this is. What we're reading here, we're seeing this here. This is Luke's preface to help everybody know this is a, an historical account of what happened. So this isn't just a, somebody's, somebody's take on it. 
This is a historical, carefully investigated account so that the next generation would know what's going on. There were, the cool thing is, is that of the many accounts that were tried to be captured at the time, we have this one. This is one of a few that we have. You want to know where the others are? In Scripture. In the Holy Bible, the greatest selling book of all time. Those are the ones that have stood the test of time. This is not just by chance. So we look at Luke chapter 1, verse 26. So fast forward to verse 26. In the six months of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. See, Joseph was from the line and the lineage of David. And here it is. The virgin's name was Mary. See, this is big. A big moment because he named this woman, this virgin whose name was Mary. Now see, Luke had no idea what was going to happen in the future. He had no idea. He was writing this just for the next generation to know what had happened. He had no idea the cathedrals that would be built because of this moment. He had no idea the gatherings that would take place centuries later, retelling this story over and over and over again. He had no idea the lives that would be sacrificed for generations in order to be able to share this story. And he had no idea the lives that would be laid down in order to translate this story, in order to get it into other multiple translations so that people all over the world would be able to read this story. He had no idea of that. He was just capturing this story so that the next generation would be able to hear and would have an orderly account of what happened. He didn't know anything about what was going to happen at this day in our lives. He just wanted to write it down so that people would be able to read it in the coming days, weeks, months, years ahead. And here we go. We have Mary now. We don't really know a whole lot about Mary. We don't really know much about her. Seemingly another random person in this story. We have this girl who is right, likely a teenager. Likely a teenager that was promised to be married to a man named Joseph. Now she likely didn't choose Joseph. Joseph was likely chosen for her and she was chosen for Mary. Or she was chosen for him. So she likely didn't fall in love the traditional way and then say, and then he didn't get down on one knee and ask if you would marry me. And then she cries with her hands over her mouth and, oh yes. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't any of that. What ended up happening was likely that, that honestly, you know, um, that, that there would possibly have been like the day in which it was going to say, here you go. This is going to happen. And her story would have played out very differently. That we know it's been played out because likely her story was going to be played out that she was going to marry Joseph, they were going to have children, and if she lived long enough, which likely she was not going to live long enough, but if she lived long enough, she would be able to meet her grandchildren, and then she would die a death, and then two years after she was dead, then likely nobody would ever remember that she ever lived on this earth, much less 20 centuries later, people telling her story. See, Mary was... This seemingly random person that shows up in this story. And you've got this angel that we read about in verse 28. The angel went to her and says, greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Now, what you've got to remember here is we see this here. Mary, she's greatly troubled at his words and she wondered what kind of greeting this might be. Now, keep in mind, angel, this angel, this angel Gabriel was not like the little white angel showing up on your shoulder, whispering things in your ear, telling you good things to do in your life like you see on TV, okay? It's not like that. This is not the angel. This angel that showed up, Gabriel, would have been a warrior. Would have been one with swords, would have been, had cuts and bruises and all kinds of things because he is doing battle on a daily basis. He's doing battle on a moment-to-moment -moment basis against evil in the spiritual realm. And so as, Gabe, as Gabriel showed up, and Mary's there, and she's like, oh my gosh, are you kidding me? What the heck is this? And here he is. Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. And as she wondered what kind of greeting this might be, she's wondering, is this good? Or is this bad? Or what's going on here? But the angel says to her, do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. What a beautiful message. You have favor with the King of kings and the Lord of lords. You have found favor 
with God. Now, he goes on with some pretty remarkable statistics in the midst of the kind of somewhat random story. He says, you will conceive and give birth to a son. You are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever, and his kingdom will never end. Now, this statement and this phrase would have been highly confusing for Mary. It would have been amazingly confusing to her. In fact, who could believe this? I mean, here is this teenager. Israel had been an independent kingdom for over 500 years. And yet this angel is telling Mary that her child, and she's not royalty, she didn't come from a royal lineage by any means, that her child would be a king and that his kingdom would never end. But she knew that, man, that's not what happened, man. Kingdoms ended at this time. But yet this king that was supposed to be her child, his kingdom would never end. But the reality is she wasn't thinking about that at this particular moment. She got hung up on one little detail. She was concerned about something and she looks at him and says, uh, Gabriel, how will this be? How will this be? How am I going to get pregnant since I am a virgin? How is this going to happen? Mary asked with any teenage girl that was just told that she was going to have a baby would ask while remaining a virgin. Now, Luke continues writing something here that's going to be a little bit confusing for each of us in this room here. Um, and because the reality is that the language that they were speaking, the language that, that Luke is writing in is not the language in which Gabriel and Mary were speaking together in. And man, it's been translated beyond it. Now we're speaking in a totally different language now. We're reading in a different language. It's just, it's really, really confusing here. Uh, but it's, it's, so anyway, the words that Luke chose in this moment, these next few moments have given all kinds of problems for pastors and theologians and, and people who are linguists and everything, given all kinds of trouble. And so it's really kind of important for us. We're not going to spend a whole lot of time um, on the next few verses uh, because honestly, the reality is it's just kind of a little bit weird. Uh, and so, so we're going to just kind of work through this. We want to make sure that the word of God stands on its own here. And so we have 35, the angel answered. Here's how it's going to happen, Mary. The Holy Spirit will come on you. And the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And so the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Now here's the deal I want to ask you tonight. How many of you, before you came here this evening, and before you heard the words that I just said, how many of you today have heard Jesus referred to as the Son of God? Just raise your hand. How many of you have heard, raise it high, come on, be proud, right? Yeah. Can you believe it? Luke was right. Luke was right. He told us. And we've just read this. It's like, oh my gosh. He, what he said would happen has happened. 20 centuries later. Here we are and nobody in this room is surprised to hear the name Jesus followed by the phrase Son of God. Mary would have been shocked. This would have been a shocking moment. This would have been an oh my gosh time. Other people would have been exactly the same way. But here we are. Here we are today just as it was told would happen. Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus, another name for him, Son of God, Messiah, Savior. It doesn't surprise anybody in this room. Luke goes on and says, even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she was said to be unable to conceive, and she's in her sixth month. Verse 37, for no word from God will ever fail. Here's what we learn from God right in this, in this moment. What we learn from God. Life is not random, and everything that God wills happens. We have to learn this. We have to see this. Everything that God wills happens. Life is not a matter of these random acts. Last week we talked about the fact that nothing is impossible for God. Absolutely nothing is impossible. We said phrases like, my God can do anything. My God can, my God will, and even if my God doesn't, I'm going to believe that there's a bigger purpose, there's a bigger plan, there's a bigger thing going on that I just can't see yet. We talked about this last week, and that's true. Life is not random. Everything that God wills happens. And so here's Mary. 
She's got these words, and, and Gabriel is there, and the conversation is over, and Gabriel leaves, and Mary's life goes back to normal for a little while. Her life kind of goes back to normal, and then the wheels begin to fall off. Because as far as we know, the angel Gabriel never showed back up to Mary to talk to her and give her some encouragement along the way or anything like that. Although I can promise you, Mary sure wishes that Gabriel would have showed up. He sure wishes that, or she sure wishes that Gabriel would have showed up over and over and over again. So let's just take a little moment down the next 40 weeks for Mary's life. The next 40 weeks of Mary's life, let's just take a little, little time here. She goes home, she begins to put on some weight in which her mom and dad are like, hey Mary, what the heck's going on? What's going on here? And uh, the teachers are starting to ask some questions and things like that. So she's coming home from school and she's telling her mom and dad, teachers are asking, can you imagine her sitting there going, hey, I sure as heck would like to hear from the Lord. I sure as heck would hear, like to hear this, this person who has favor from God in this moment. Please help me know what the heck I'm supposed to do at this point right now. It would be crazy. She then needs to tell Joseph, the man that she is betrothed to, she needs to tell him, which is a whole other story on how he chose to stay with her. Whole nother story that we're going to spend some time on later about how he wants to stay with her as she is telling him the ridiculous words of, I am pregnant and God is the father. What? I mean, what? You have lost your ever-loving mind. And I'm supposed to marry you? What? I mean, can you imagine hearing those words? Yeah, right. Exit stage left. I mean, that's crazy talk. It's just ridiculous. I'm pregnant God's the father. And then Joseph gets to look at Mary a little bit later on and say, hey, Mary, I got some bad news and I got some worse news. The bad news is Caesar has just issued a decree and we've all got to take a big old donkey ride. That's the worst news, right? You're pregnant. You got to take a donkey ride. Get a little donkey and go donkey riding while you're pregnant, right? So you got to do this thing. It's going to be crazy. We got to go. We got to go have our, our the census to be taken. We got to travel to Bethlehem in order to do that. And so here she is, Mary, Miss Highly Favored. <laughs> Mary is highly favored, getting on a donkey, taking a donkey ride for almost 120 miles while she's pregnant. Now, gentlemen, I realize you have no idea what that would be like. I have no idea what that would be like. I can imagine. I don't really want to be on a donkey for 120 miles as a man. In which, just for the record, all of you men in this room, every day of your life, you should wake up in the morning and say, God, he made you a man. Okay, you should. You should do that. We should all do this. God, thank you for making me a man. Because you don't, you know, there's no risk of taking a 120 mile donkey ride while you're pregnant. But Mary, she had this risk. Here's Mary. She's got this. She's like, this is not what I had in mind. As I got these words, Mary, you are highly favored. She's like, sweet. No, that was not sweet. This is like, what? Brago on the donkey. The situation got even worse because you know why? She took so long. They took so long because she had to take a lot of bathroom breaks. I promise you. Okay. She took so long for them to get there. That when they got there, the crowd, the crowd had already arrived, and what, guess what kind of message they heard? There's no room where. In the end, because Gabriel had not made hotel reservations for Mary and Joseph. He had, he had not done his job, apparently. Because Mary was highly favored. She was chosen by God. But yet here she is. There's no room in the end, and now she gets to go be in a cave or a, a trough or whatever. This crazy environment was in which she was supposed to yes give birth to her son it was craziness and then her continue her situation continues to deteriorate and there are numerous points in mary's life that i promise you mary was asking things like why would god allow this to happen i can assure you she's asking this question we can look at this and go why would god allow that to happen that doesn't sound like the king of kings and lord of lords showing up in this story that doesn't sound like this so Jesus would be born, and then it gets even worse because Herod became jealous. Herod became jealous, and Mary, for the rest of her life, would know that Herod made a decision because her son was born on this earth, and he was called the king of the Jews. He was called the king. He was called the one that would, would be the Messiah. And because of that, Herod was jealous. And you want to know what Herod did? Because Herod was on a search to find this baby boy, and so Herod killed every single boy under the age of two. But guess what? The Roman centurions were so good at their job that they weren't just going to go back to Herod and say, we think we got everybody. No, the Romans, they were so good at their job that they went ahead and killed every boy, every girl, every child under the age of two that they could find. 
And Mary, for the rest of her life, this is probably a detail you've not thought about in this story. Mary, for the rest of her life, would have to live with the fact because of her son's life, because of the life that she brought into this world, there would be hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of babies that were slaughtered in a ruthless, random act of violence. Sure, you Mary's going, God, why in the world? Why would you let this happen? This is not okay. It's not okay. And then Jesus grew up, and Mary's life continued to deteriorate. Jesus grows up, and Mary would have to watch her son beat within an inch of his life. She would have to watch the most gruesome, brutal death of her son. And sure, this, I'm, I'm telling you. This story, this does not seem like the story of one who is highly favored. This does not seem like the story of somebody who the Lord is with you. This does not seem like the story of he shall reign forever and ever. And it sure as heck doesn't seem like the story of his kingdom will never end because he's about to die. Man, this is tough. But man, it was at this moment. It was at this very moment when all seemed lost and all meaning seemed to go right out the window, the bigger picture comes into clarity. It's this moment, the bigger picture comes into clarity. God all this time had been taking this scarlet thread and had been leaving this beautiful tapestry together of life's events that just seemingly did not go together. He was leaving this tapestry together and it was in this moment that he entered for his greatest involvement in all of human history. And God pulled the thread for the picture to come into focus and in order to make sense. And here it is. God has sent his son into this world to pay for the sins of man. God didn't send his son into this world for the fairy tale. He didn't send his son to the world so that you and I would be confused, thinking if we choose to follow Jesus, that means health and wealth the rest of your life. He didn't send his son into the world to, to make you and me think, when I say yes to God, that means gravy train of life for the rest of my life. No, he sent his son to this world to declare there is sin in this world. And because of sin, there are tragic things. There are unfortunate things. There are horrible things that are going to happen on this planet. But take heart. I have overcome every single bit of that because Jesus didn't stay dead. Jesus didn't stay dead. Jesus came. He paid for the sins forever and ever and ever. Sounds familiar. His kingdom shall reign forever. He came and he paid the sins of man forever and ever and ever. Amen. And you've got to understand that when we look at this story and we see all of these random things, we see the shepherds and we see the, the angel and we see this virgin and we see Joseph and we see her parents and we see Jesus that's born. We see Herod and we see this ruthless slaughter of children. We see all of this stuff happen. We can look at this and we can go, man, there is all of this random happening in the story. And you know what? That sounds a whole lot like the world I live in. It sounds a whole lot like the events of the life that I see on the news. It looks a whole lot like the life that I live here, and I sure as heck wish my life played out in a different way than it does. But man, we look at this, we go, God sent his son of the world to pay for the sins of man. And that thing in every single one of us that wants order, that thing in every single one of us that wants God to just pull that scarlet thread and make the tapestry come together, that thing in you that wants order is the fingerprint of God in you. Because we can look at this story here, we can see that God is a God of order. He is a God of purpose. And while we may not can understand the full picture of everything, the thing that we can trust is He is God. And He has our best interest in mind. My God can do anything. My God will do. And even if my God doesn't do what I can imagine that needs to happen in this world, I can trust Him that He is a God of order. That someday I can look back on this moment in my life and God will show me He's here. Because he sent Jesus to this earth. And we know him as Emmanuel. That's who we know him as. 
Because God is with us. God is a God who knows you. God is a God who cares about you. And God is a God who longs for the very best for you. And what he's saying to each and every one of us in this room tonight is, trust me. Trust me. I got this. What seems random, it's not random. I'm all around you. I've got you. Trust me. Jesus is the way. He is the truth. And he is the life. He is our direct connection to God the Father. He is our direct connection to freedom. He is the direct connection that we can promise and we can trust. And with hope we can go, today's going to make sense someday. Because God is a God of order. Now in just a few moments, I'd like for us to do something. We're going to pray together. But before we do that, what I'd like to ask is a very simple question. Is there something in your life today that doesn't make sense? Is there some event going on in your life right now that seems like it just doesn't fit? Seems like you just can't figure out where it's coming from. If there's something going on in your life right now, maybe it's just you don't understand why a relationship is the way that it is. You don't understand why a job has worked out the way it has. You don't understand why your family is the way that it is today. You don't understand why whatever the case may be and fill in the blank. If there is something in your life right now that seems like it's out of order, seems like it just doesn't fit, and you're thinking, there's got to be an explanation for this. I just can't wrap my mind around it. Would you just lift your hand for just a moment really nice and high? If there's something that you're sitting there going, I don't get it. It doesn't make sense. I don't like it. Just keep them up there. And everybody look around the room. Look at the hands that are up in the air. Because in just a moment, we're going to pray. And we're going to pray for each other. We're going to gather around. And so if there's somebody else, keep them up. Keep them up. Somebody else. Is there anybody else that you're sitting here and you're like, I don't really want to raise my hand because I don't want anybody to touch me? It's okay. People don't have to touch you. You can just look at them and say, would you? You don't have to touch me. And nobody's going to get offended. But would you just take a moment? If there's something you're just going, man, I don't get it. Would you just take a look around the room? And what we're going to do in just a few moments is we're going to ask God. We're going to ask God to do something special. We're going to ask God to give them faith to trust him with this. Because see, faith, our faith is not centered upon God. God moving into the order in which we expect for our lives to be. Our faith exists in a way where we are trying, we are, to, we are longing to move towards God. A better way of saying this is simply this. Our faith isn't to try to move God into our plans, but to move and trust God in His. And so in just a few moments, we're going we're gonna to circle around. And then just if you'd like to just pray where you are, you didn't want to raise your hand while I go. I get that. But if you didn't want to raise your hand while I go, we're just going to spend time praying. We're just going to ask God to give faith to trust Him with whatever it is, that, that God's going to make it make sense. That, we, that, that they can trust God with the outcome of whatever it is that's going on. And then in just a few moments, I'm going to close this out. And then we're going to sing a song of response. And we're going to cry out to God. And we're going to trust Him with the remainder of the season. So you guys remember where those hands were? We're going to stand to our feet and let's just take a moment and let's gather around and let's just pray. You don't have to know what their prayer is. You don't have to know what the thing is that they're struggling with. But if you would just take a moment, gather around them. If you're close enough to be able to put a hand on their shoulder, that's great. Unless they give you this number, don't do it. And that's okay. You don't have to, don't do that. Okay? But let's just gather around and let's just pray. Can we do that? Audibly. Pray out loud and pray over them. God, can you make this make sense? Can you help them to see that their faith is in you? You're bigger than all of this. Let's take a moment. Let's pray. Let's go to church. You know, Lord, here we, here we are this evening. And we're, we're at the, what's supposed to be the happiest time of the year. The merriest of Christmases. And Lord, there's so much in people's lives that tends to weigh down. Lord, I just pray that, that you will help to make sense of where things fit. Because, Lord, you are a God of order. 
And Lord, would you remind each and every one of us that there's this thing, that all of this desire that we have, that if we look back and it's sickness of a loved one, or it's a tragic accident, or it's a, it's a reality that happened, a financial disaster, or um, a divorce, or uh, an abusive situation, or whatever the case may be, we just can't seem to see the purpose behind it. We can't seem to, to wrap our minds and our hearts around what it is, and where it fits in life, and why it happened. And Lord, would you help us to be reminded that that desire that we have for purpose, that desire that we have to see plan, that desire that we have to see and look back and go, ah, I see. But that is your fingerprint on our lives. Lord, would you help us to see it tonight? And that as we enter into this Christmas season, as we anticipate the birth of our Savior, and this Advent season, Lord, will you help us on the front of our mind that we would, we would be thinking constantly, Lord, you are with us, and you are a God of order. And in the chaos of this world, and in the random things that are going to happen over the next 24 days, before we celebrate the birth of Jesus on Christmas Day, will you help us to see that you are not a God of the random. You are a God of purpose, and you are a God of plan. You are a God of action. You are a God that is near. You are a God that understands us. You are a God that is near. You are a God that comforts. You are a God that makes sense of the senseless. And Lord, will you help us to move towards you, to enter into your courts with thanksgiving, and to rejoice and to praise your name. Lord, that your joy may be made complete in each and every one of us in this room. And that because of Jesus Christ, that you sent your son to this world to live on this earth and to die a terrible death, his mother watching all of the while in things that seemed to not make sense to the 21st century eye, even to the first century eye and ear. But Lord, you say, no, there is a greater purpose to something that seems reckless, something that seems absurd, something that seems so tragic. And Lord, may we find hope as a result. Lord, you are amazing. And you can do anything. And we thank you for that. Thank you for sending Jesus. Thank you for making sense of things that seem random. And thank you for giving us the peace that passes all understanding. Father, we love you. We praise your name tonight. We pray this through the name of Jesus. Amen.